Good afternoon, everyone. We're very happy to be hosting this next breakout session here. Usera Guide, um, hosted by Bruce Townsend. So I'd like to pass it off to you, Bruce, and uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Nick. Hey, good afternoon, everybody who's uh, on board and uh, watching and listening to us this afternoon. My name is Bruce Townsend. I am the Chief of Employer Engagement for ESGR. ESGR stands for Employer Support of the Guard and Reserve. Uh, ESGR is a federal program underneath the Department of Defense. It was formed in 1972, which is uh, ironically enough, at the same time that we went to an all-volunteer military force in the United States. We did away with the draft. We've been uh, all-volunteer ever since that time. Currently, in the United States military, the reserve component which is made up of the National Guard and the reserves of the uh, other branches, makes up approximately 40% of the total force. Now, that's a, that's a gigantic chunk of our total force in the military. And uh, within the reserve component, we have a great deal of skills and uh, uh, professional uh, abilities that are not common or very common in the active component. So the reserve component is a, is a critical part of national defense and a critical part of the total strength of the military. So to, uh, to get to the point of USERA, USERA stands for the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Simply we pronounce it USERA. Uh, Congress enacted the current version of this law in 1994. We just had the 27th anniversary of the USERA law being enacted. And the reason you, Sarah, is important to you as employers, as job seekers, as veterans is because it, it can impact on both the ability of the reserve component service members to go away and do their military jobs in return. And it can, and it can impact you as employers, team members, fellow employees, and, and veterans in general. So on that, I want to introduce our panel today. We have, uh, we have three really outstanding individuals that are going to work with me on this panel to talk about you, Sarah, in general. Uh, first is John Berry from the Berry yes, Law man. Firm. Uh, John, welcome aboard. Uh, we also have Kevin Schmiegel. Uh, Kevin works for um, uh, the, uh, where did I, oh yeah, KMS Strategies. And uh, I'm gonna, I won't go into too many details about all these individuals because you can read that on their bios on the main page. Um, but one thing about Kevin that you won't find on his bio, and I know this from other connections we have, just a couple of days ago, Kevin competed and finished the Boston Marathon. So, Kevin, kudos to you. That is that is a Herculean accomplishment. Uh, when I was a much, much younger man, I did a, a, I did a marathon a long, long time ago, and it put me down for three months. So God bless you, sir, for being able to do that, and thank you. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Lee Metcalf. Lee is a uh, retired admiral from the United States Navy Reserve, and uh, he is also a business consultant. So I'm going to uh, start off the talk today uh, with uh, bringing on John Berry first. Uh, John, as an attorney, I know that uh, you have some insights on you, Sarah, that probably the rest of us do not. Uh, many folks have heard of you, Sarah, but they really don't understand its depth and its application. So what I'd like to ask you is what are the most important things for reserve component service members to understand about you, Sarah, and questions about when, they're, when they feel that their rights have been violated? And following on to that, what, what are um, the um, responsibilities of employers to those reserve component service members, and, and what are possible penalties, pardon me, for violating you, Sarah. Over to you, John. Thanks so much. I, I mean, I, veterans are an important part of our organization, of our uh, of our community, right? And, and, and veterans in the workplace uh, have rights that employers should respect. I think great employers understand the values and they want to keep veterans, keep them happy. And they understand that veterans are getting free training, right? Free leadership training. And so what happens, Bob, can you turn the lights so I can see? What happens a lot of times when, when, when veterans get into certain situations where they don't, uh, all of a sudden they feel like they've missed out on an opportunity or that job is not available, uh, their employer may be in violation of the law. And the first thing the veteran needs to know is to go to the employer and say, I believe that something, you know, that, that I'm entitled to this. Go to the employer first. 
And then, of course, I, you know, I, I can go through the dry stuff, and I wasn't expecting to go go through it all first. Uh, but uh, basically, they can, you know, if 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 it cannot be worked out informally, the, the veteran has a right to bring a civil action under 38 United States Code uh, 4322 through 4323, and it authorizes both um, equitable and legal relief. And so, you know, a lot of times the service member just wants to be put back in that position, but there can also be financial penalties, including paying attorney's fees. So it's important for employers to understand that uh, if, a, if, if you have a member of the Guard or Reserve and they're out at training and they've provided you adequate notice, uh, you can't punish them for that training. And we've seen this happen a lot. We've seen several deployments uh, that that and there are there are some people who are superstars in the guard and reserve that get called up frequently, and the employer needs to understand their obligations, but the service member also needs to understand their rights, and they can't they cannot be penalized for their service. Uh, so, you know we have similar laws under the FMLA. People go on a medical leave. Uh, there are uh, people go on leave to have children. They can't be punished for these things, and uh, service members have the same rights. They cannot be punished for their military service. If they feel that they are being punished, then there is help. And there are a lot of law firms that handle uh, these types of cases. But but I would say the best course of action early on is to handle it informally, right? And if you're the HR manager and you're, or, and you're looking at this situation saying, well, you know, what, what do I do? You know, my job is to manage the resources and this individual isn't, isn't here. And then they keep getting deployed again and again and again. Uh, that's a tough situation to be in, but I think the key is that the service member gives proper notice. Let you know, let let your team know as soon as possible when you receive those orders, or that you that you might be receiving orders, so that they can prepare. And I think really what it comes down to is it's a team effort between the business and the uh, and and the service member. And, and look, we're all on the same team here. We need to work together. And when it doesn't work out. Yes, the service member absolutely can demand that, that they be given that opportunity that they are denied or that they be reinstated to that position when they come back. But they, it, it, like I said, it's treated as if you were still on the team during the time that you deployed. Hey, John, you, uh, you mentioned in your, in your answer there uh, about handling things informally. Uh, and as a part of ESGR myself, I, I'd like you to expand what's a really good way to, for a service member or an employer to handle that informally? Well, I think it starts with the culture of the organization, right? I mean, we're here you know, as leaders to make sure that our team is successful. And so when I say handle it informally, you know, we've had uh, several service members deploy uh, in the last few years uh, and, of course, the past decade. And uh, actually, I think this last year, two years in a row, we've won the uh, Pro Patriot Award for the ESGR for our support of the Reserve and the Guard. And the reason we've been successful is because we continue to have that dialogue. We're proud of the service member service. We thank them for their service. And if there is something going on, they're going to deploy. The, the question shouldn't be, well, how are you going to be gone and how do we replace you? But how can I support you? What can we do to support you? So if there's good communication, uh, there usually are not issues. Where I've seen problems is where the employer says, the service member didn't tell me. They didn't provide me orders or any documentation. Next thing I know, the service member's gone. And now they're claiming that they were, uh, you know, that they had this deployment. I have no record of it. I think open, honest communication from day one, as soon as the service member knows, is the right way to avoid any legal problems. Uh, furthermore, I think it's be, it, it's just being a good team member. If you know you're going to be absent, you give your team as much advance notice as you possibly can. And that usually is going to, to solve the problems. Uh, like I said, if there's a cultural problem within the organization, then there may, you may, need, there may need to be a lawsuit. But uh, I would say for most service members, you know, they're growing up in the ranks understanding that there's a chain of command. You follow that chain of command. You take care of your team by keeping them informed. Thanks, John. Appreciate that very much. Um, and we may come back to you if we have to touch on the, the more uh, specific legal aspects of this. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to move over to you. Um, the, the, the question that, uh, that I came up with for you is how does USERA affect businesses uh, either in general or on a specific basis today? And, and um, how do you incorporate 
How did you incorporate ESGR and you, Sarah, when when uh, you were part of the founding of Hiring Our Heroes with the Chamber of Commerce Foundation? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank Vet Indexes for including me on this and joining you, Bruce and, and John and, and Admiral Metcalf. And I'd be a little bit remiss as a Marine not to say happy birthday to the Admiral. <laughs> the Navy celebrated its 246th birthday yesterday, so they got thank us you I got us by a month and the Marine Corps will be celebrating on November 10th. So happy birthday to, to the Admiral and to all the, the sailors out there who celebrated yesterday a little bit belated. You know, before I get into the, um, hiring our heroes and how we worked with ESGR and the employers that were part of hiring our heroes, I, I guess I would just say as a, a father of a Marine too, who was in the reserves, um, it's important for me to be part of this and and to hear what's going on right now. And and also just in, in light of current events, especially over the last 18 months and the, the tremendous sacrifices that our guard guardsmen and reservists have made uh, since the outbreak of COVID, um, since uh, you know what happened here in the nation's capital earlier in January and, and just routine deployments that the guard and reserve do. So I wanted to, to say that up front and then maybe close with that, but my time at uh, Hiring Our Heroes started in 2011 when we when we launched the program at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, in March of 2011. And a lot of people who um, who know the organization and know about the work that we've done over the last decade um, understand that Hiring Our Heroes is part of the world's largest business federation. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is affiliated and has members representing three million businesses across the country. So it was a program that was easy to start at really the height of unemployment for veterans. We saw a 12.1% unemployment rate across the, the veteran community. And for veterans, post 9-11 veterans, it was as high as uh, 25 to 30% at, at different times leading up to 2011. So it was a necessary thing to do. But hiring our heroes is just not about jobs for veterans. It's about creating understanding of the value of veterans and military spouses in the workplace. And really the overarching concept behind founding that organization was to bridge the civilian military divide by creating understanding of the value of veterans and military sp spouses in the workplace. You can actually connect civilians with our military in a more meaningful way. And I think that highlighting you, Sarah, was a big part of that. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I don't think, um, when John talks about the legal aspects of this, a lot of times employers are just ignorant to what the requirements are and what the rules are and what the laws are to include the service members who are ignorant about it too. And what, what we really want to do in um, situations like this, when we have these opportunities is to highlight these things in a constructive way so that the same mistakes aren't made going forward. So we partnered very closely with uh, ESGR and not only at the national level, it's funny when I was preparing for this and I did a search of you, Sarah, there was actually um, a C-SPAN video with myself, Tom Donahue and the chair of ESGR at the time um, speaking at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce with the 40 companies that represented the Veterans Employment Advisory Council and the Military Spouse Employment Advisory Council uh, of Hiring Our Heroes at the Chamber. And many of the companies that were represented in that room that day went on to be recognized as Freedom Award recipients. Initially, they didn't know what they were supposed to do, but when they heard what the requirements were, and moreover, when they heard what our guardsmen and what our reservists were doing, they felt it was the right thing to do, not only right for their business by getting incredible human talent, but the right thing to do for our country as a national security imperative to support um, the most important thing that we can do as the private sector, working with the public sector to make sure our military service members to include guard and reservists are supported. Um, I was also really fortunate during that time to co-chair uh, Department of Labor Vets Advisory Council along with Mike Caney uh, for the Institute of Veterans and Military Families. And what was really interesting about that um, council was 
it was all about public-private partnerships again to solve for veterans unemployment. And if I look at that and what we're talking about today, this is what's re required with any issue that we face as a country, a whole of nation approach to solving problems. And that includes the public and private sector working together. That is what ESGR does with companies. That is what USERA is supposed to do is to bring people together to solve for what is a really challenging problem. And that's why I wanted to highlight this in context of what we've seen over the last year and a half, two years, in light of what we know our National Guardsmen and our reservists are doing for our country, for our military, for our national security. Um, if you think about the role of the National Guard and our reservists in response to COVID in all 50 states and DC and the territories, if you think about our Guard and reservists who deployed to vaccination sites across the country, away from their families, some of them staying in hotels, just like you would if you went overseas. If you think about the 25,000 National Guardsmen who were deployed to our nation's capital in early January from all 50 states, from Washington, D.C., and from all four territories to support the inauguration and for months after to secure the capital, that is significant. And I don't think people across the country really understand that to include our employers. And that's, that's not that it's in, it's important that we highlight these things, because if you take all of that and realize that our National Guardsmen, National Guard units continue to deploy. Yeah, we had to draw down the final troops of Afghanistan have returned home. That doesn't mean deployment stop. And of the 225,000 men and women who will still deploy each year from our military, the Guard and Reserve represent a significant portion of that, and they continue to bear the burden. So in my mind, this is important to highlight, to build understanding, to build empathy, and for employers to go a step beyond what the requirements are, what the rules are, what the laws are. Let's be honest, um, there is a war for talent in this country right now. There are industries that are starving and thirsting for good people. And they can't get better people than our National Guardsmen and Reservists who are our citizen soldiers. And if we look at it in that light, they can't just check the box. And that's why I was so excited to be on here. Vets indexes encourages employers to go beyond checking the box and meeting just the requirements because they highlight the companies that are going a step beyond and doing more. And that is important for people to look at excellence and raise the bar higher because we are at war for 20 years, our nation's longest war, and it will continue and these deployments will continue. And I think I'm proud of being part of Hiring Our Heroes before as the founder. I'm proud to be an alumni and um, Eric Ebersol and Mona Dexter and the team at Hiring Our Heroes continue to do what Vet, Vets Index does too in amplifying what employers should and can do to do better for our guards, our guardsmen and reservists. So I'm now an ambassador with Hiring Our Heroes too, um, which is really exciting for me to go back to my roots and be part of that again. And I'm excited about, you know, seeing what ESGR continues to do with HOH and other programs and employers across the country to make this the forefront uh, in employers' minds, because if it's not, it is a risk to our national security. And I think people have to understand that and embrace our guardsmen and reservists like never before in the context of our nation's longest war and what we have seen from the brave men and women in our guard and reserve over the last two years in particular. Thanks, Kevin, very much. Uh, Lee, I'm gonna bring this over to you. Um, you know, as, as both a, a retired uh, a retired senior leader in a reserve component, uh, as an ESGR member, uh, you ran our, our uh, Missouri committee for, uh, for six years. And as a, a successful on entrepreneur, I'd like to ask you, what challenges are faced by both the reserve, com reserve component members and the employers? Uh, specifically, what I'm talking about here is that three-legged stool you mentioned, um, and expand on the role of what the ESGR ombudsman can do as an alternative to going directly to the Department of Labor or DOL vets, who actually, um, they own the law as far as, that, uh, as, far as you, Sarah, goes. Bruce, thanks. I, I also want to thank John and Kevin for being part of this uh, and this uh, an amazing talent that they and and the organizations they represent and obviously the 
the road that I have paved came out of my 34 years of military service, six active, and then 28 more in the reserves. During that time, I worked for large corporations. I worked for myself as a small business person. Um, and I had a, a reality check in both worlds around what it takes to survive, not only to thrive in large corporations and medium-sized companies, but also the dynamics associated if you're a small business owner uh, going back and forth with reserve. What I'd like to add to John's comment, particularly around the quote informal component of this, that's a resource that ESGR actually provides. The ombudsman word is a really critical component of the mission of ESGR. So when an employer is trying to understand what is it you're up against reservist and they get sideways with each other or there's miscommunication, ESGR is there as a resource. Pick up the 1-800 number, give a call, we'll connect with someone who literally will sit down. And I could go through hundreds of examples of where just that communication mechanism solved the problem. Here's where we were stuck. Here's what you didn't know. On occasion, we've had to go a little higher up the food chain because it was a first line supervisor who kind of didn't understand, was acting not in the best interest of the company or the reservist, was just trying to get his or her job done. And we would just elevate it. Can I talk to your director? Can I talk to the CEO? Do you know what's happening here? Can we work through this? And, and, and the biggest metric that we used was how many of these can we fix? And of the lion's share of them, we could. To John's point, USERA puts teeth in it. That's where if it can't be fixed and there actually is a legitimate grievance, somebody is now tripped a wire. There is a cycle to get legal support and to ultimately hold a, an employer accountable. But there's also two sides of the street. You alluded to it. On occasion, we've had to get a hold of Sergeant Snuffy and say, look, what are you doing here? You didn't give them a heads up. You keep changing your drill cycle. What is it that you're trying to uh, have a grievance against? You're not holding up your end of it. And that's the part that ESGR also plays in being able to do some good guidance and counseling. I had 100 volunteers in the state of Missouri. These were mostly retired military, but many who were just inspired to help, who had no military background. ESGR trains them on how to do this kind of an engagement and three mission sets. One, to do the ombudsman to engage where we can. The second is to reward because ESGR is the only, is the only DOD entity that's authorized to give recognition and awards, just like John alluded to with Propatriot and other awards. Um, and third, the issue of just being able to get the word out. What are we doing? How do we coordinate guard and reserve? I have to tell you, I, being a Navy guy, I didn't know how to speak National Guard. And in my first three years, I came to realize just how amazing that resource is to this country. Employers have to navigate two pieces, not just the USERA component of this, but with our National Guardsmen, they get called up on state deployments as well that don't fall underneath the federal guidelines. There are state guidelines. So your HR community has to understand kind of both worlds and what the dynamics are there. And they are double duty type folks. Not only do they respond, our National Guard, to the federal demands, but they're also constantly responding to floods and other kinds of strife that's happening in that state. And these are an amazing resource that we under undervalue, in my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm such a strong proponent of the National Guard now. But the reality then is here's the deal. The guy or gal that's caught in the middle is the first line supervisor. I reported to a manager when I had a job at McDonnell Douglas. And, and they, they were all supportive of me. And I was gone here there and then again a couple of months later but that first line supervisor still had to get a job done that's the person we need to help that's the person when i go into an organization i say look let me hug that person that's the one that's doing the the the, the hard work of getting the company's work done but valuing and 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 to john and kevin's point 
in many cases going way above and beyond to support not only the re, the, re, the departed deployed reservist but their family who's still back there and things they're doing on both levels that's a really critical component to the success of this and i urge employers you can't do enough for your first line supervisors who are really the ones who engage and keep both of these legs on the stool correct. As the reservist is trying to go forward, not worry about money, not worry about a job, try not to worry about family because they're in harm's way and they got to focus. And what employers are, God love them, stepping up to do is to relieve them of the anxiety of what am I coming back to? The ESGR is there when they try to come back and there's something that's gotten a little tricky, a little disconnected. And like I said, our job is to take the lion's share of those and fix them before they become a real festering problem that abuses and or hurts both the company and the reservist. I'm happy to give more examples, but that's kind of my observation. Mm -hmm. All ESGR plays and 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 the and the dynamics associated with employer employee relationships thank you lee you know for every for everybody who's watching and listening right now prior to uh september 11th 2001 most people really had never most employers had never heard of you sarah it wasn't a big wasn't a big thing even in the federal government or the department of labor um but after that within one month after the events of september 11th 2001 the first reserve component service members were deployed with their active duty counterparts to Afghanistan, and shortly thereafter that to uh, Kuwait and into Iraq. And since two, November of 2001, the reserve component, like I said, it's 40% of the total force has been called upon to support the active duty all around the globe, not just in the combat missions in Iraq or Afghanistan, but in humanitarian service support missions, literally around the globe, all seven continents. And yes, I do include Antarctica in that. Um, so one of the things that employers are, are dealing with, and I mentioned this in an answer to another person a, a little bit ago, is, is what we call deployment fatigue. Those service members that they have on their payroll who belong to the Guard or the Reserve, they're gone a lot, as, as Lee mentioned in his career, he was. And, and before I retired from the Army Reserve, I was gone a lot, and it used to frustrate my employer. So one of the things that we try to do with you, Sarah, is to recognize, yes, it's a law and, you, and uh, the service members are protected, but we also try to recognize, in the case of ESGR and, and the federal government at large, the sacrifices that are made by those employers at the federal level when we're talking about the reserves and then at the federal and state level with the National Guard. So on that, uh, John, is there anything specific that people need to understand about you, Sarah, uh, as far as uh, employers now, as far as what they can and cannot do underneath you, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are specific things that they can and cannot do. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, I like to call the, the big three. Um, you know, they can't fail to employ someone or discriminate because they're a member of the military. Um, there are certainly are reemployment rights for uh, Guard and Reserve members, and there's the protection of the benefits as well. And so if a Guard and Reserve member feels that this isn't being done, they can go to the Department of Labor, their attorney general, and try to resolve it administratively. If that doesn't happen, then they can get damages in terms of back pay and benefits. And if uh, there's a liquidated damages clause where they can get double damages or double back pay and the employer would have to pay for the attorney's fees and expenses and other things associated with the litigation. So there, there are some teeth in it. Now, that being said, uh, look, I was an infantry officer coming right out of uh, uh, College of William and & Mary. And, and I, when I went off active duty, uh, I thought I was done. I was at my father's law firm. It was a pretty small firm, about a 10-person organization at the time. And uh, I deployed as a company commander to Iraq. So, and that put a great strain on that small organization. And you have to understand these smaller organizations are not exempt. Most, most of them are not exempt and that hurts them the most. And so I had to figure out what I was going to do with my caseload. And then when I came back, I had to build up a caseload. So I saw the direct economic uh, effect on, on, on the law firm, on the organization. And we were a very small organization back then. And so 
you know, as I stated, I ended up retiring. Um, I stayed in the guard and, and retired as a battalion commander. But I saw that happen more frequently. It seemed the smaller businesses were hit the hardest. The, the large organizations had a plan for this. And I think from our military service, we know you always have to have a contingency plan. And you always have to have leaders step up. And so I think one of the big uh, takeaways from our organization was that if someone's going to deploy and they're going to be out of the net for a while, you should already have a plan. There should be a backup plan because uh, we lose people for other reasons as well. And so you don't want to be in a situation where uh, there's an administrative complaint and you have to deal with the Department of Labor or the Attorney General or what's worse, you don't want to have to deal with a federal lawsuit uh, where you could end up paying a lot more money uh, and I, I would just point out that it also culturally can really hurt an organization outside the legal ramifications. Yes, it gets expensive if you, if you, especially if you willfully violate uh, you, Sarah. But uh, but essentially, this is this is you know, this is a law that protects. You know, I think it protects our nation as a whole. If we didn't have this in place. Right. It'd be very easy for service members to say, yeah, I don't think I want to do that deployment. Right. But but we know once we're on orders, we got to show up and we have to perform for our country. So I, I think it's 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 important. It is important that it has teeth. And I think, you know, as 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 Lee and, and Kevin have stated, what we do to inform uh, you know, as, as service members to inform our our, uh, our companies is extremely important. I think if you can start off with a good relationship that's going to be most, you know, that, that is going to be uh, the best way to handle it because ultimately you don't want to be in a situation as a service member that they say, well, we were going to fire him for cause anyway. He wasn't a good team member and he was going out the door and this is just an excuse. So I think that our top performers keep the team informed. I agree. There's a complete war on talent and we should be looking at it from the perspective of this is a great opportunity as employers for the guard and reserve to train our people, for them to get leadership training, to get training they can't get inside the organization and a great opportunity to recruit. We love to recruit military. And if you treat your, your service members right, they're going to tell their friends and I tell them, hey, bring somebody back because we want to work with professionals. We want to come with people who with batteries included, know how to lead. So yeah, there are penalties, there are problems uh, if you do not if you if you discriminate against a member of the Guard or Reserve, but I would tell you to look at it from the other side that it is, provides a huge advantage in the talent war to get the team members that you need. Uh, and I think that's so important. Um, everyone uses the analogy the carrot and the stick, right? I, I go back to the Freedom Awards and the recognition that employers get. And I, I've stepped down from nonprofit work, but my life's passion is to connect private sector companies with the causes I believe in. And those are mostly military and veteran causes. So I started to consult companies on this strategy, which really drives business outcomes, right? It, if they think about, um, recruiting and retaining military talent. The, the truth is if they adopt a policy that goes above and beyond from a hiring perspective uh, and taking care of our military families to include guard and reservists, they are gonna realize a very loyal workforce. And at the end of the day, that's gonna drive down the cost of recruiting and retaining good people. And everyone knows if they run a company, how expensive it is to find and keep good people. So it, it is a bottom line decision that they're making to go above and beyond. If they tie those hiring practices to a really strong social responsibility strategy where they support military family and veteran nonprofits in a concerted way over and over and again, and tie it to a communication strategy where organizations like vets, indexes, hiring or heroes and ESGR award them for hiring, providing support through social responsibility strategies. And they amplify that through communication saying, we are the best of the best. All of those things will work together, right? All of those things will create a loyal workforce that drives down recruiting and retention costs and brand loyalty among customers who are military families and veteran families. Let's be honest, 17% of adults in this country are military or veterans and connected families. 17% of the adult workforce. And if you do those things and you develop a loyal um, customer base, a loyal employee base, 
at the end of the day, your bottom line is going to improve. And that's the way companies view things. So I, I think we have to focus on the carrot more than the stick when we talk about USERA and we highlight what ESGR does through the Freedom Awards, what VETS Index does to amplify the best of the best of the best, and what programs like Hiring Our Heroes are going to do in a few weeks at their annual gala when they celebrate companies that are doing the best work on hiring. So I think this is where we have to go and what we should encourage more of. And I know Lee has seen the results of those things in Missouri in his own state when they tout employers big and small, right, Lee? No, absolutely. And the, re the reality is that all of them that we give these awards to say, look, I didn't do this for an re a reward. And I, and I said, look, here's the deal. Example, please accept the award because you've earned it. But more importantly, I need you as a reference point to show others. And I'm proud <laughs> in the state of Missouri, we've either had a finalist or an actual Freedom Award winner every year for the last and so as long as that award's been going on, and, and I use them very purposefully to help inspire others, not, not to chastise, but to inspire them. Here's the kind of things that you could do. And those small organizations in particular, an HVAC company that's only got eight people and one of their primary folks, who's really good because of his military service, gets deployed. That took a chunk out of his game. How did he not only hold the ground to allow him to come back and keep his business going. But while he was gone, the guy's house caught fire and he brought the community together to help them rebuild part of that, that guardsman's house while he was gone, taking care of the family. That's the kind of above and beyond. That's the kind of engagement. I, I can feel the spirit all over the country. Not everybody has it quite that what, uh, what, well, well honed. Um, and so therein lies part of our, our role of, as ESGR is to elevate those stories. It's not just about coming to D.C. for a Freedom Award. It's, it's about how to inspire all of our employers to the level of impact they can have to support those who literally sign the Blake check and go when they're called. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We're coming right up on the end of our time here. So um, there's one question in the chat. Kevin, I think this is one I'd like you to answer if you can see that from a lady named Sally Doherty. Um, we've mentioned the Freedom Award. I, I want to expand on that very, very quickly. The Freedom Award is the highest award given by the Department of Defense to employers in the United States. Every year, 15 employers are recognized by the Department of Defense for their outstanding support of their reserve component service members through ESGR and the Department of Defense. 15 are awarded each year. But ladies and gentlemen, that is called down from a pool of approximately 3,000 nominations every year. Those nominations come from a service member who works for that company or that corporation in whatever state across the country. So the competition is quite stiff. From 3,000 nominations, we call that down to 15, and the Secretary of Defense, him or herself, signs off on the award proclamation for that. So it's competitive, and, it, and it's a really nice recognition. Uh, I'd also like to point out that VETS indexes, when, they, uh, when uh, George was talking this morning about their awards program, and I'm very gratified about this because I helped them get it set up, they use, a, they use um, metrics on, uh, to award their companies that recognize their companies based on how many ESGR recognition awards those companies have received. From Patriot Awards, which are given to the First Level Supervisor, to the Pro Patriot Award, to the Freedom Award. So um, there we go. There's, uh, yeah, there's the Pro uh, Patriot Award. The Pro Patriot Award. That's nice. So anyway, I'd like to thank all you gentlemen for coming on board today. And for everybody who tuned in to listen, I hope that this was informative. I'll stick around a little bit longer if anybody wants to uh, ask a question. But uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to crossing paths with you again very soon. It's been an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. see the question um she, uh, she wanted to know where is it uh where can she find that statistic you mentioned 17 percent of the workforce are veterans or uh, veterans or affiliated yeah i'll get it to her i was working with uh cvs health and their team there i got it from dave lee 
So yeah, I th- what I think it is, it's you know about one percent serves about seven percent are veterans, and the other ten percent would be the veterans' family members and, exactly. and that kind of thing. I think spou- that's what it is, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, the spouses too. Yep. Got All it. right. Thanks, man. Yep. See ya.